Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. If you're a new subscriber and you haven't put any comments down, do let me know whereabouts in the world you're from and what you enjoy drinking, because I do love hearing from you. But before we continue with tonight's story, which is part two of the part one, I'd like to remind you that if you haven't heard part one, do go back to it because you wouldn't want to miss it. So let's continue with our story. Mackenzie's eyes widen. She takes a couple of sips of the sweet Coca-Cola, her eyes not daring to focus on Mrs. Goodwin. Mrs. Goodwin interlaces her fingers into an upside-down arch. She looks at Mackenzie awkwardly. There was a dreadful accident, I'm afraid, on your grandfather's farm this morning, near Piedmont, I believe it is. It appears he got off his tractor to remove an obstacle in his path, but the tractor was still on. It was rolling forwards and ran over him. I'm afraid, I don't know how to say this, but he's dead. My grandfather is dead! No! No! cries Mackenzie. Dreadful sobs come bounding out of her mouth like hysterical leaping frogs. No! No! Please not my grandpa. He's my best friend. Please not him. Not him. Anybody else but not him. He was my best friend. I know, sweetheart. Mrs. Goodwin cradles Mackenzie in the pillowy bosoms of her chest, while Mackenzie sobs into the material. There, there, she says. I know it's dreadful news, Mackenzie. I'm sure it was very quick. I'm sure he died instantly. Unfortunately, accidents like this do happen. My husband died falling from a roof. It's one of those things you can't get your head around. I do know how it must make you feel. There's nothing worse. Am I going home? asked Mackenzie. I need to go home. I need to be with my mother and I need to be with my dad. My dad's going to be so devastated. This is his father we're talking about. I don't know how we're going to cope. Of course you're going to cope. And you are going to go home, Mackenzie. But you're going to have to stay at school for a couple more days. You see, your mother has to organise some relatives from Ireland on your father's side of the family to come over. But once that's sorted out, you'll be going home. She wants you to stay here for a couple more days. She wants you to be very strong. In the meantime, do what you want. You're excused from classes. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here any time of the day or night, 24-7. Do you understand that? I'm your confidant, your in-house mother. What you share with me is between us alone. Mackenzie's story. From the moment Mrs. Goodwin entered our classroom that day, with sombre eyes fixed directly on me, I knew something was terribly wrong. I couldn't believe that my grandpops was dead. He was my very best friend, my father's father. I could talk to him about anything, and to die in such an abrupt, impetuous, unheralded way was completely devastating for me. I decided to walk around the school grounds, to soak in my own melaconia, and I didn't care about the no-access sign on the woodgrove. Not any more, and certainly not today. Why should I care about silly rules and regulations when the entire world had fallen on my shoulders? These were extenuating circumstances, any way you looked at it. Mrs. Goodwin had said I could do what I wanted today, and the Woodgrove seemed to be calling my name, as if offering me solace in my grief. My grandfather used to tell me that the trees could listen to your heart and strengthen you in times when your heart was heavily burdened by despair and grief. I knew I'd feel close to my gramps in a place like this. He was an outdoorsy man, an intrepid adventurer and a keen explorer, an eager hiker and mountain climber who embraced the rural backcountry with an insatiable zealousness that could never be muted or subdued. He had toiled, tilled and ploughed the soil since he was a strapping 18-year-old boy. He loved the earth, everything in it and on it, without exception. I put on my trainers and my tracksuit and proceeded into the woodgrove. It was hard to fathom that a day could be so beautiful when it was so wickedly tarnished with a devastating sorrowful grief. I felt as if everything should be sobbing for my grandfather's fortuitous exit from this earth, but everything carried on like before. The birds tweeting, the trees rustling, a bee buzzing, 
a butterfly bobbing over the colourful flowers. There was a cheerful, eclectic mix of trees in the woodgrove, along with many a mature oak tree, with resplendent branches that stretched out so graciously in the canopy above my head, like lofty sculptural bronzed arms that glistened with a leafy green bounty of sumptuous foliage. My eyes beheld a gossamer, irradiate light from the forest canopy that twinkled brightly through the trees and danced across the forest floor in a subtle luminescence. A couple of charming butterflies were darting around some pretty woodland flowers that arrested the viridescent scenery with their colourful, delicate blossoms. There was a soft breeze blowing generously, and it accompanied me on the walk like a refreshing companion, who cooled down the inflamed heat of the searing pain that burnt a hole in my heart, while my trainers crushed twigs and leaves beneath my feet. Obstensively, the path was not altogether smooth. It was undulating and hilly, with the occasional angry rocks jutting out of the soil like large incisors. I could hear the tweets of the bird's song trilling through the forest, and watched both a squirrel and a chipmunk eyeing me through dark, twinkling eyes. For a moment it was like my grief floated away, like a bird on a wing, as I was mesmerised by the transfixing beauty of this place. I continued to amble along, overcoming obstacles along my path, like the occasional tree trunk that was carpeted in a thick layer of bountiful green moss. Finally I came to a stream, situated on a lower elevation in the woods, but I climbed down the hilly incline, and sat for ages on a smooth rock, where I collected handfuls of little stones to throw into the water. The water crashed and thundered so violently against the rocks. It bubbled up into a white foam, as it plundered down the forest in a downward trajectory. I sat there for a long time. How long, I'm not sure, but it was long enough. I sometimes gazed up at the little openings of the trees that invited a brief view of the perfect cobalt blue sky. While I sat there on the rock, I cried and cried until I could cry no more. But the forest seemed to cushion my grief, and the woodland trees seemed to commiserate with me, and whisper to me comforting words of solace that I did not audibly hear, but instinctively felt. And absurdly ridiculous as this may sound, I could feel the presence of my grandfather with me. I could almost see him standing there, with his father Christmas white beard, his red bandana over his white hair, wearing his red plaid shirt and dungarees, and staring at me through his cornflower blue eyes. Suddenly the whole ambience of the forest changed. I noticed a couple of deers racing past me, barely noticing me at all, as if something had completely terrified them out of their wits. I'd never seen deers so agitated before while a squirrel scurried away, and the bird song in the forest suddenly evaporated, almost as if it had never, ever been there. It was like the forest had become an inauspicious, hostile, malevolent place. I suddenly sensed I was not alone. Someone was there, but I didn't know who it was. Then I heard that roaring sound that I'd heard a month prior, that Mrs. Goodwin had tried to pretend was an injured coyote but no one had believed such an absurd suggestion, not even for a second. At first blush, this hauntingly airy sound was so spooky, so discomposing. It vibrated into my chest like a clamorous resounding bell. In a trice, a couple of acorns are thrown at me. I look up to see this dark creature standing behind the tree. I realise it's a Bigfoot. The creature is indicating for me to follow her. She makes her intentions clear. Then I hear the discomposing sound again. It travels through the forest expeditiously, at a cannonball-like efficiency. It's coming my way, and whatever it is, it sounds terrifying. The Bigfoot calls out to me. She speaks in a strange, alarmed voice, in a curious language. Her scrambled words are fast and furious. Her expression is charged with a poignant, troubled concern, and very evident dismay. It's like she's warning me. The danger's in my mist, and she wants to help evacuate me from it. But can I trust her? I hear the ponderous feet charging through the woods. I realise at once that the Bigfoot is trying to rescue me from this treacherous being that is bounding towards us at a rapid gallop. It's like my grandfather's voice is reassuring me that I can trust this Bigfoot, a creature I would normally have fled from in terror. But who do I trust more? The ambiguous owner of the disembodied roar 
moving through the forest like a charging hellhound, or a Bigfoot that is expressing a genuine concern towards me. I move over towards her quickly. With one arm she swings me onto her back and jumps up into the tree branch of a very mature oak tree with very sturdy branches. She manoeuvres me so quickly that I don't have any time to protest or react adversely. She puts me down on an upper branch next to her. I'm not good with heights, and looking down from this level is daunting. But the Bigfoot covers me with a leafy green foliage to camouflage me, but is less concerned about concealing herself. Then I see him. I have never been so grateful to be hidden behind all this leafy green foliage that has rendered me inconspicuous and about as invisible as I'm going to get. Unarguably, through a little hole in the foliage, I discern a creature whereupon your worst nightmares are most surely made. This creature is without doubt the most gruesome, ghastly predator that I have ever had the displeasure to encounter. He would make a male lion seem like a friendly little pussycat. This creature epitomizes all that is insanely evil, all that is duplicitous, all that is wicked. It belongs to the devil and his minions. This creature does not belong to our world, any more than an unwelcome weed belongs in our yard, or a tree branch belongs in the swimming pool. It shouldn't be here. It should not exist. There is something supernatural about the creature, and if you told me he was a demon, I would a thousand percent believe you, for he is in my mind's eye exactly what you would expect to encounter in the flames of hell. The forest is suddenly infused with a most diabolical offensive scent. It burns my eyes, scratches the back of my throat. It gives me the overwhelming desire to hurl up the contents of my stomach, but I manage to hold it together, although every part of my body is trembling. The Bigfoot gives my arm a reassuring nudge, as if to tell me it's going to be all right. I'm so relieved to be in her presence now. It's almost as if my late grandfather summoned her to my rescue, as bizarre as that may sound. The creature I'm viewing from the high branch of an oak tree is like a cross between a werewolf and a human, as his face is like a wolf. But that is where the similarity begins and ends. His bright red eyes are like the devil. His body is built like a powerful athlete, with sinewy muscle definition, that is so pronounced it rather reminds me of the gnarled roots of the oak trees, as it bulges out of his body with an obscene, intrusive impertinence, while the body is densely covered with a crop of short, thick, shiny hair, and the legs are almost half human and half wolf, with talons that are so sharp they could shred you to pieces if given the chance or opportunity. The creature's nostrils are flaring, and I realise in that moment he has smelt my scent. He is looking for me. He seems puzzled and perplexed not to find me. But he does look up at the tree, and on seeing the Bigfoot, he unleashes the most terrifying roar. But he seems to be subdued by the Bigfoot's presence, as if he knows he can't take down a Bigfoot, but he'd like to try. Rather like the love-hate relationship you sometimes see between cats and dogs where they have to learn to live together, but are not terribly pleased about it. The Bigfoot on the tree snarls back at the werewolf. She lifts up the edges of her mouth and lets out a high-pitched scream like an ambulance siren, and then she breaks off pieces of branches, throwing them down on the creature that raises a fist at her, lets out another discomposing howl, and then thunders through the forest like a rhino charging over the wilderness until it's finally gone. Not for a moment do I believe that the werewolf-like creature saw me, but boy did he smell me from miles away, entering what he assumes is his territory, I hasten to say. The female Bigfoot mumbles something, and then throws me on her back rather like a large sack of potatoes, although on her back I'm probably like a very small one, and then she glides down the tree, and for a moment I stand there, staring at her, gawking. She was much taller and bigger than the werewolf but she's got the kind of gentle demeanour that makes you believe she abhors violence, and a face on her that is so intrinsically human. She is serene and peaceful like the forest itself on a sunny day, and she appears so graceful, so dexterous, so agile, but it's her eyes that are very hard to explain. I know there are people out there that have had bad experiences with Bigfoot before, but hand on heart, this critter's eyes were just so filled with a compassionate, tender kindness 
and there was not an uncongenial bone in her body. I think Bigfoots are remarkably like humans. They're good ones and bad ones. But unlike human beings who have prisons to incarcerate the most wicked among us in society, the same cannot be said for Bigfoots. I look at her directly in the eyes and say, Thank you. Thank you. You've saved my life. And I really believe she did. She escorts me safely through the forest, and I run back to my dormitory to ponder and reflect over the incongruous things that have just transpired, that demanded my attention so much that the level of grief became much more bearable for me. Suffice to say, I feel duty-bound to tell Mrs. Goodwin that I had disobeyed the sign and entered the woods. I want to warn her about what I'd seen, as I didn't want other kids to get into harm's way if there was a werewolf wandering around the place. I thought Mrs. Goodwin would laugh at my seemingly preposterous story, but she claimed to have seen the predator too. We both decided that this werewolf-like beast had certainly laid a territorial claim to the woodgrove on the school property, but there was a kindly Bigfoot watching over the people at our school, keeping this wicked predator in check. Mrs. Goodwin believed that the stones thrown at the werewolf on that fateful tenebrous evening, when she was so nearly attacked by the vindictive beast, had been thrown by the same protective Bigfoot, who had also delivered me from harm. Eight months later, Serafina's story. I was a new pupil at this Georgia boarding school, the name of which I will keep shrouded in mystery, for obvious reasons. My parents believed that I was rather an undisciplined pupil, that was always getting up to mischief, and was boycotting my homework every day of the week to slip out of my bedroom window to meet up with my sixteen-year-old boyfriend, who lived in a house conveniently across the way. It was true, of course, that's exactly what I was doing, but how my parents knew about this, and what I was getting up to, was a mystery to me. I would willfully abandon my homework, to spend some time at my boyfriend Larry Bowman's house, whose parents were very easy going about my presence there which certainly infuriated my parents, who thought my boyfriend's parents were completely irresponsible. I knew my schoolwork was suffering, and that one day I would likely go to medical school, but not if I didn't put in the work. I was naturally bright, but I was bone idle, and the teachers knew it, and so did I. I can't count the number of times I was lured into the headmistress's office to explain why my homework was not completed, and why I was doing so badly in school. "'Explain yourself, Serafina," said the headmistress to me, throwing my English composition book right at me. "'Where's the essay you were supposed to have done about the day in the life of a Union soldier in the American Civil War?' She scans through the empty pages and looks at me with her astute eyes. "'I'm sorry, Mrs. Weaver, but I didn't have time to do it,' I exclaim. "'That's funny,' said the headmistress. "'Your mother informs me you're given plenty of time after school to complete your work.' and on the subject of your grades in the last few months they've gone down the toilet you've plunged from straight a's to c's and that's a considerable drop seraphina and i know you can do a lot better than that your mother believes you're bone idle what do you have to say for yourself young lady i'm not bone idle mrs weaver my mum's wrong i i work very hard i lie does this look like you're working hard seraphina says Mrs. Weaver, throwing my empty exercise book at me across the table. If you carry on like this, young lady, I will have to retain you myself after school to complete your homework assignments under the supervision of one of the teachers. Do you understand that? Yes, Miss Weaver, I had said. My mother had threatened to send me to boarding school if my grades didn't improve. If you don't get your act together, I won't have any choice in the matter. At boarding school they have supervised homework for you, so you'll be forced to buckle down and do some hard graft. But I don't want to go to boarding school, I had protested. Tough titty, you'll be going if your grades don't improve. I'm tired, Serafina, of your apathetic indifference to your homework. And that dropout of a boyfriend of yours is an incredibly bad influence on you. Oh, goodness gracious, he's so dopey, so lackadaisical. I doubt he even knows what day of the week it is. And I don't doubt he doesn't know what on earth is going on in the world. He's like living in limbo. And as for his parents, they're like a couple of sloths who entertain themselves by hanging upside down all day and only getting up to take the long, arduous journey to the refrigerator to retrieve an ice cream from the freezer cabinet. I don't doubt. Why are you being so horrible about my boyfriend, Mummy? He's nice and his parents are nice too. 
My father intervenes on my mother's account, like he always does. Your mother is not being horrible, young lady. She's being very patient with you. You want to become a doctor one day, do you not? But you're not going to get very far if you refuse to study. And your mother's right. Your boyfriend is not a good influence on you. And his parents should be very ashamed of their behaviour. They shouldn't allow you to hang around there all day. But they positively encourage it. Lazy bum! Lazy bum! says my little brother Matthew, sticking his tongue out at me. Mummy's going to send you to boarding school because you're a very bad girl. Mummy says you're a bad girl. Your boyfriend is a dopey sloth. Your boyfriend's a dopey sloth. <laughs> of course I hadn't believed it would happen, but here I was. I was surprised to find I enjoyed myself at the school, as I'd made some good friends there, who were so much less unruly than I was. They were well behaved and disciplined. When I saw the sign on the Woodgrove saying, Danger, do not enter, I knew it was strategically placed there, to warn off other kids from going exploring in there, as the teachers like to keep their beady eyes on the pupils, especially the untamed, unbridled ones, like myself. I perceived it was the quintessential place you could possibly get away with smoking a pack of cigarettes, or even drinking a touch of alcohol, if it came into your possession. It seemed like the ideal opportunity of escapism for me. And the warning signs were like a welcome invite. I thoroughly enjoyed dicing with danger. It appealed to the venturesome, obstinate side of my character that rebelled against being told what to do. I had successfully persuaded, coaxed, and manipulated one of the more obliging day scholars to buy me some cigarettes, and she did, without the teachers knowing anything about it. I remember asking the girls about the keep out sign and why it was erected outside the woodgrove. There was one girl who shared a dorm with me called Mackenzie, who rarely overreacted when I briefly mentioned I wanted to go exploring the Woodgrove. You don't want to go in there, she said. Why not? I challenged her. Let's just say there are bad things that happen in there. The one thing that people fail to realise about willful girls like myself is that saying something like that to me is not going to be a deterrent in any way. It gave me a driving desire to explore the woodland oasis. Of course I had been told about the ghost of Mrs Lennox ambling down the school corridors at the dead of night, and knew it was all a hoax. There's no such thing as ghosts, I informed my new friends. My bet is that the matron, what's her name, the fat lady with the grey hair, oh Mrs Goodwin, she made the whole thing up just to scare us so that we will resist creeping around the place at night. One day armed with my brand new box of cigarettes, I knew that smoking them alone would be boring without a cooperative friend. I didn't even like smoking all that much, but the thought of doing something that could land you into heaps of trouble made life a whole lot more interesting. It gave me that quintessential buzz of adrenaline, rather like living on the edge. I'd managed to persuade one of the girls, Addison, to come into the woodgrove for a smoke. She looked at my cigarettes longingly. She came from a family of cigarette smokers and from a young age she had breathed in the smoke and often smoked cigarettes herself. Her parents weren't bothered about that. I knew she would not be able to resist my offer. She was practically drooling when she saw my cigarettes. All right, I'll come with you, but no one can see us. We slipped into the woodgrove together when people were gathered around the oak tree for the usual peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but one girl was having a birthday, so ice cream cake was also on offer that day. We knew the lure of ice cream would keep our friends conveniently distracted and so preoccupied, which meant we would be unlikely to be seen. I could see Addison was losing her cool. She was such a pathetic wimp. She was beginning to express doubt about this adventurous opportunity. If anybody sees us, we could get into double trouble. I don't want to get into trouble. No one saw us, I assure her gingerly. There's ice cream being served up. No one will have given us a fleeting thought. They'll be far too distracted. But what about the keep out danger sign? Supposing the woods really are dangerous. Addison, are you for real? Don't be such a wet blanket. I thought you had more guts than the other girls here. That's why I asked you to come with me, I told her. At that unexpected compliment, Addison looks rather pleased. You think I've got guts? She asks me. Sure, I say. You've got guts, Addison. 
Not like the other dropouts at school who squeal if their hair is tangled. You're not like that. You're brave. That's why I handpicked you personally. In truth, I thought she had the courage of a jellyfish. She was so translucently pathetic. But I could see my flattering words had somehow inflated her confidence, and she eagerly followed me into the woods. What can I say? The woods literally took my breath away. I'm quite sure they have this effect on everyone. I almost forgot about the cigarettes we intended to smoke. I was so arrested by this enchanting, beguiling sanctuary. It was like finding a secret kingdom all of your own, within the grounds of the school. I knew without a shadow of a doubt I'd be coming back here again, with or without Addison. It was magical the way the light filtered through the canopy of the towering trees, buttering the ground in a shimmering glaze that made everything in the forest twinkle and sparkle radiantly. While the ground was bespeckled with the confetti of fallen leaves, intertwined with broken twigs and pebbles, there were delicate woodland flowers that had pushed through the ground to anoint the wood grove in bursts of pretty colour and in the distance I could hear the sound of a stream filtering through the valley, gushing over the rocks in a forceful frequency. Let's go to the stream, I say exuberantly. The forest was filled with the pretty ebullient sound of birdsong. It was blissfully tranquil, so we immediately skirted down the hilly elevation to sit by the stream. We began to light up our cigarettes. Addison takes a big puff and blows out a stream of white smoke. I can see that she's an experienced smoker. Woo! That's so good! My mother gets through two packs of these a day. She's a nervous wreck without them. Of course, she's been to the doctor hundreds of times. He tells her that if she doesn't quit smoking, she's going to end up with lung cancer. But my great-grandmother died at 97, and she didn't stop smoking until the very day she died. My mother told this to the doctor, but he said that it didn't mean that she would be the lucky one to live to 97. He couldn't count the number of times smokers had told him exactly the same story. Well, maybe your family's got good genes, I say. I don't understand why you smoke. If you want to be a doctor one day, Addison says to me. I mean, you've got to practice what you preach. It's like you can't tell a 500-pound woman to lose weight if you're 600 pounds yourself. I mean, that would be crazy. I suppose so, I say. But right now I'm having fun. I'll worry about all those details when I'm older. All of a sudden, Addison looks at me. Her eyes grow round. There's something watching us, she exclaims. There's a movement in that bush. That bush over there. It wobbled. Don't be ridiculous, I say. Is that your idea of a wind-up? No, it's not, says Addison, stabbing her cigarette into the ground and rising up to her feet, brushing the leafy bracken off her skirt. I'm sorry. I'm getting the hell out of here. Something's watching us. Listen, everything's grown very quiet. I can't even hear the bird song anymore. That means a predator's around. My dad taught me that. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. There's something there. I'm really scared. I want to get out of here now. I pick up a couple of stones and throw them at the bush to show my friend that there is nothing there and nothing to worry about. And then we see it. And boy, do we see it. Let's just say there are some things you see you wish you could unsee. And this is unequivocally one of those occasions. Both me and Addison observe this monstrous wolf-like humanoid standing on two feet like a man with blazing red eyes. It was furious with us, especially after I'd thrown stones at it. The only way I can describe this creature as quite literally the most grotesque, sinister being I've ever encountered. It was huge, powerful, bodeful. Me and my friends scream. We tear through the forest as fast as we can, shrieking at the top of our lungs, calling out for help. Help! Help! Someone help! I feel certain one of us is going to die. I don't doubt it. I know it. I've never felt so much fear escalate through my entire body, like a powerful steam engine on full throttle. This thing is right behind me. I can feel its breath. It's hot breath on the back of my neck. It smells like decaying flesh. It's repungent. It's vile. The creature roars at us as it runs after us. It's touching me. And then we see Mrs. Goodwin. She stands there in the forest with a rifle in her hand, firing off rounds of bullets after the creature. The creature turns around and scurries away. Mrs. Goodwin had quite literally saved our lives. 
but she's not happy with us. Me and Addison are trembling so much. I literally wet myself. I can't help myself. I've never been this frightened. Mrs. Goodwin is shouting at us. Did you not see the sign outside the Woodgrove? It says, Danger, keep out. Can't you read? What on earth were you doing in the Woodgrove? I was hardly going to admit we'd both been smoking. But if she'd got close to us, she would have smelt the evidence on our breaths. And that would have been dreadful. I don't want you telling the kids about what you think you saw. It'll give them nightmares. I think this Woodgrove is its territory. It's a very dangerous creature. You're a very lucky lady, Seraphina, that Mackenzie here had your back. She's been keeping a beady eye on you. She said you'd been asking too many questions about the Woodgrove. She knew you were up to something. She came to call me when she saw you breaking the rules. She was concerned for your safety. What do you have to say for yourself, young lady? I'm very sorry, Mrs. Goodwin. It won't happen again. I should think so. You're lucky I got here in time. Let's just say after that gruelling experience, I knew I was never going anywhere near that Woodgrove. Ten months later, Melissa's account. That evening I finished my homework, under the supervision of Mrs. Goodwin in the dining hall. She watches over us from the furthest table, and once the clock registers nine o'clock, we're free to go to our dormitories. When she told us that we could pack up and go, everyone bustled out of the dining hall as fast as they could. We retreated to our classrooms, to put our books away in our desks. Finally we made our way up the staircases, back to our dorms in single file. My dormitory was on the fourth floor, a floor above Mrs. Goodwin's suite, which is on the third floor. We all got dressed in our PJs, we brushed our teeth, washed our faces, and finally returned to bed. We could hear Mrs. Goodwin padding up and down the corridors to switch off the dormitory lights. We always knew when she was coming, as the sound of her slippers were very distinctive, and as she was a slightly bigger woman, she was less light on her feet, so her movements were conspicuously much more pronounced. It's lights out, she told us, scanning us all to check we were in bed, with her shrewd brown eyes that did not miss a beat. You could never underestimate that woman, as many did. As that woman was as discerning as a voucher, she was a no-nonsense lady, but with a heart of a lion. For many of us, the quintessential mother figure, when we were far away from home. You could literally talk to Mrs. Goodwin about anything. She was such a great listener. I knew that there was a story behind her life, as she had buried away herself in the boarding school, rather like a nun in a convent, as if she wanted to escape from the outside world. I'd heard her husband had died in a fortuitous accident, at fifty years of age or something like that, after falling off a roof at their home, but I was not sure if the story was actually true. I didn't care to ask. There are some prying things that my mother always taught me. You don't ask a person, even if you're bursting with curiosity, and this is one of those things. I had heard about the ghost, rumoured to haunt the school corridors at night, called Mrs. Priscilla Lennox, who was one of the original headmistresses of our school. I'd seen her picture hanging up in the corridor, and her painting gracing the wooden panels of the main hall. She was a woman that had dark hair, done in a typical Marilyn Monroe hairstyle that I believe was indicative of the time, and very dark piercing eyes. I was told that she'd been a tough taskmaster in her day, a formidable woman who didn't suffer fools gladly. I had thought her picture seemed quite sorrowful, actually, but that was just an instinct rather than a confirmed knowledge. Some of the girls were afraid to go to the toilet at night unaccompanied. They were petrified of encountering the ghost of Mrs. Lennox. So it was not uncommon to prod someone wide awake so that you didn't have to make that journey all alone, even though there were toilets and showers on every dormitory block, only about 15 feet away from the main dormitory. It wasn't like you had to walk that far. I wasn't bothered about going to the toilet on my own at night, as I thought the ghost story was unlikely to be based on truth. And even if it was... I knew of no one who had physically seen the ghost. I will, of course, admit that there were times many of my friends reported an airy feeling when they went to the toilets, and a sense of foreboding that they weren't alone. Some even claimed to have heard the clip-clop of women's shoes. Let's just say I'd experienced the former, not the latter, but I thought it was a product of a highly active imagination, rather like a planted suggestion in your mind that you believe to be true so much so that you're open to interpreting any random noises or impressions as potentially being the ghost of Mrs. Lennox. Personally, I thought the story was creative hogwash, possibly made up by Mrs. Goodwin herself, so that we wouldn't get up to mischief at night.
Even my mother thought that this was likely to be the case. On this fateful night, Mrs. Goodwin looks in at us and pipes. I don't want to hear any noise coming from this dormitory. Not like last night. Some of you were rather noisy. I slept in a bed an arm's distance from a girl called Colleen Joyner, who always wanted me to tickle her arm at night, which I found infuriating. But finally she relieved me of the tedious duty, and after a few whispers and giggles, we soon fell fast asleep. All of a sudden I wake up with the most dreadful pain in my stomach, unlike anything I've ever experienced before. Indeed, I was in such agonising pain that I was literally clutching my belly. I don't honestly know why I didn't wake up any of my friends. That would have been a wise thing to do. I just thought I could get help from Mrs. Goodwin. I felt that I could still manage this pain, but I was wrong. I stagger down the passage like an inebriated drunk that can barely walk. I want to cry out. The pain is so intense that I'm holding on to my stomach tightly, struggling to actually breathe. I know I can't walk any further. I'm exhausted. I slump down against the wall, my feet sliding flat on the ground, sweat now pouring down my face. I'm breathing unsteadily. I feel as if I'm going to pass out and faint as if all the energy has been sapped and ruthlessly expunged from my body. I know something is terribly wrong with me. I feel powerless to call anyone. I know that I'm never going to get to Mrs. Goodwin's sleeping quarters. I can't even walk down the corridor back to my own dormitory to get help. I'm never going to make it down a flight of steps to the third floor. It's a particularly dark, tenebrous night. I see that as I glance through the wrought iron balustrades that fringe the passageway and overlook views onto the school's rolling lawns, I can distinguish a few dusky silhouettes of trees thanks to some permanent outside lights that remain on throughout the night. I'm sitting there, clutching my stomach. Then I hear a clip-clop of shoes. I sigh with relief, thinking someone is coming. But who? No one walks down the passageways at night with shoes that sound almost like a horse's hooves. Clip-clop! 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 The feet are walking towards me. The sound is getting closer and closer and closer. I can hear the feet stopping within a couple of feet of me. And then there's silence. But nobody is there. But where I'm sitting is becoming increasingly chilly, as if I'm suddenly sitting in a refrigeration unit. I then get this airy feeling that someone is watching me. Could it be the ghost of Mrs Lennox, I wonder? Help me, Mrs Lennox! I think I'm dying. I feel a bit silly, as no one is there, although it feels as if someone is standing right there, looking down at me. The footsteps seem to turn around, increase their pace, and dash away. At this point in time, I'm absolutely convinced that I've encountered the ghost of Priscilla Lennox. I felt her presence. I may not have physically seen her, but I really did feel her, and I inadvertently asked her for help. But can a ghost actually help me? This I seriously doubt. If someone doesn't get here soon, I could be found in the morning, lying dead in this passage. Barbara's account. I sleep in my dormitory on the fourth floor, and I wake up in my dreamy state to see a woman standing at the end of my bed. She seems familiar to me, but I can't work out where I've seen her before, as her hairstyle is quite old-fashioned. At first I think I must be dreaming. I rub my eyes, and I look at the woman. I look at her intently, thinking that this has got to be a weird dream. She indicates for me to follow her, but what is she doing in my dormitory? Why is she waking me up in the middle of the night like this? Who the heck is she? And why has our dormitory turned into a freezing refrigerator? I don't know who she is, but I decide to follow her, and that's when I see Melissa struggling to breathe, clutching her stomach, and groaning in the passageway, slumped against the wall, so my attention is immediately diverted from the woman. I look for her again, but she appears to have vanished. Where did she go? You'd think she'd lend a helping hand, rather than run off like that. Melissa's breathing is scarily shallow. She's sweating like a pig. Her eyes are rolling in the back of her head. And I shake her as hard as I can, but she's pretty unresponsive. Melissa, what's wrong? She grumbles, but I see she's clutching her stomach. I'm beginning to wonder if she's having issues with an appendix. I suddenly freak out, as if the weight of the world is on my shoulders, because if I don't get help for Melissa in time, she might surely die. Propelled by a sense of urgency, I shoot like a rocket down the stairs, hammering loudly on Mrs. Goodwin's door, and shouting at the top of my voice, Mrs. Goodwin! Something's wrong with Melissa! Call an ambulance! An ambulance now! 
Mrs. Goodwin runs to the door, opening it abruptly. She's standing there in her pyjamas, with a cell phone in her hand, her fingers trembling, her sleeping eyes bouncing out of her slumber, while her face is drained of all its colour. "'What's wrong with Melissa?' she asks me. "'It's not good, Mrs. Goodwin. She looks like she's dying. I think it's her stomach. It might be an appendix.' Mrs. Goodwin calls the emergency services at once, and then she races up to the fourth floor with me to attend to Melissa, who is so consumed by her pain, she's barely conscious. It's like she's confused, disorientated. Her heart is pounding so fast. The EMTs arrive and efficiently put her on a drip, rushing her to hospital. I was so relieved. I felt as if now she was in good hands. I asked around about the strange woman I'd seen. Who was she, says Hilda, a friend of mine. I saw her standing at the edge of the corridor when the ambulance arrived, and then she disappeared, but she was watching everything. But when I looked up again, she was gone. It was only a day later, when I was in the hall during assembly, and my eyes glanced over to the picture, which I had shown to Hilda. We both realised we'd seen the ghost of Priscilla Lennox, the original founder of our school, who'd woken me up to alert me to the fact that Melissa was in trouble. Suffice to say that Melissa was diagnosed with a sepsis caused by a viral infection. She was ventilated, given IV fluids, fluid replacement, along with a vasco-constrictor, antibiotics and steroids, and soon made a swift recovery and returned to school. But if I hadn't discovered her that night, the doctors say she would definitely have died. We were to discover that although Melissa never physically saw the ghost of Priscilla Lennox, she sensed the woman's presence and believes the ghost had alerted me to the fact that Melissa was in trouble. So yes, our school holds within its very foundations many mysterious secrets. So there you are. These are our incredulous stories. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.